Hello, I'm going to do the first class for um, our circuits class. This is Engineering 221, and it is a class taken the first semester of your junior year. Um, so I'm going to get started by talking a little bit about electricity in general and kind of the history of it, because it's a good lead into kind of the basic properties and knowledge that we're going to discuss today. Electricity was started as a party trick about 1745 and at the time it was what happens when I rub these two things together I'm going to shock you that kind of thing. Um, in 1749 Benjamin Franklin um, wrote about an electric party which in which everything was going to be done with electricity. Um, they were going to cook turkeys, they were going to um, heat food, make wine, all of that good stuff with electricity. Um, and at the time, a party wasn't a party, a lecture wasn't a lecture, a dinner wasn't a dinner, unless it's some kind of electric curiosity. So it was sweeping the world and everybody was talking about electricity and the potential of this new thing that they had discovered. It started out pretty simple. So they would, for example, um, take feathers or fluff and use attraction and repulsion of those charges um, to see what would happen. They would uh, see if something was attracted, repelled, or if it made no difference. And it started really simplistic with very small things and static electricity, um, like balloons and hair and things like that. Um, though obviously they didn't have balloons back then, but that kind of concept. Um, and then it quickly became more complex. So in this picture, you can see um, an example of this. So they've got, you know, a person being electrified via turning thing here. Um, and then that person is touching another person and then that person's attracting something on the plate. So they had discovered that if there was static electricity, something got kind of absorbed up, but they wanted to see how complex you could get. And then you can see in this the start of a complex circuit. So a circuit has by definition a closed loop. So something has to be connected all the way through. And you can see that in this situation, there is a loop going and they were starting to figure out what could and couldn't be done, what was possible and what was not possible. Positive, negative charges, circuits, that kind of thing. And these examples get more and more wild. This is like somebody getting shocked with a sword. Um, because this is getting electrified, very strange stuff, very weird stuff, and it was all the bloom. It was everywhere. There were poetry, there were magazines and art, everything used electricity. You can see a couple nice little poems here. What makes our first felicity, but the pure electricity, div divested of all fiction, motion makes heat and heat makes love, creatures below and things above are all produced by friction, right? Um, so they were they were discovering this, they were so excited about that. And because of that, it changed so fast. Everybody wanted to know more. And so bet between kind of the mid 1700s and 1943, there was thing after thing after thing happened and it changed so rapidly. Um, that in 1943, we had our first computer and computers now are made up of millions and millions of little teeny nano circuits. And it started as some fuzz that sticks to your finger. So with that, I'm going to start talking about this chapter. So this is chapter one in the book. And by this end of this chapter, you should be able to use and understand what charge and current are, be able to relate charge to electrons. Um, define voltage, define power, be able to relate power, energy, and voltage, and be able to correctly identify an element is supplying or absorbing. Um, so let's start with the fundamental base unit of electricity, and that's charge. Charge is electrical property of a particle, um, and this is a base unit. And what that means is that you cannot break it down any smaller. It doesn't get any smaller than base units. Um, and so this is a property um, which creates an electric field, and this 
can cause a force. So if you have a positive and a negative charged object, they will be attracted together, right? If they have the same charge, in other words, a positive and a positive, they'll, they'll be repelled. And if it's a negative and a negative, they'll be repelled, right? So those forces, right, they feel forces on each other. And that's what makes it um, a property of this. Um, so we use the Q as our symbol symbolically for charge, and we use the units coulombs um, in order to measure it. So just like any unit, um, if it's named after somebody, it's spelled with a lowercase, and if it's not named after somebody, it's spelled with an uppercase. So a coulomb is um, a huge amount of charge. So we almost never use coulombs. Um, almost always we work with smaller units. So picocoulombs, nanocoulombs, or microcoulombs. Um, the base unit of electricity um, can kind of be thought of as electrons and how they are interacting with the system. So an electron has a charge of negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So you can know that like there are a lot, right? A lot, a lot, a lot of electrons in a single coulomb of charge. Um, and that's why we tend to use these smaller units like pico, nano, and micro. Um, so let's do a little quick little experiment here. Um, and you're going to take a wire, a battery, and a light bulb, and you're going to try to build a circuit. So since we're doing this remotely, you can go to this Tinkercad Learn Circuits website. You're going to have to make an account, but it'll let you play with it. So let's go there together. Righty. So here we are in Tinkercad, and Tinkercad is kind of an online simulation software. Um, and it lets us build things. So we can search for something like a battery and just click and drag and drop that battery. Um, so we wanted a battery and a light bulb. Sorry, I failed to, there we go. Got to click off of it. Light bulb. All right, there's our light bulb. Okay, so we have a battery and a light bulb. In order to create a wire, you're just gonna click and drag and you can hook this up however you want. Um, so I recommend pausing the video here and trying to figure out how many different orientations you can create. All right, so hopefully you got a chance to play with that. Um, and so let's do a couple here. So option one would be this side to the negative and then that side to the positive and you can press this start simulation and our light bulb should light up. So that one's a good valid orientation, okay? So let's move that back over there. Another orientation would be wire from the red to that terminal. And then we're gonna move this over here and there we go. And now we have the light bulb light up. So that's number two. Um, alternatively, we can hook this guy up to, oops, not there that. Okay, then we can hook this up between here and here. And that to there. And voila, light. And last but certainly not least, we can hook this guy up to that guy. And then this guy to that guy and light. Now, there are some orientations that would not work. For example, I can't hook up this to that with a wire. Get rid of this wire. That's still two wires and a bulb, not a light, right? I can't do it via connecting those two wires, not a light. So there's a bunch of things you can do and a bunch of things you can't do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about why this works and why it doesn't work in some situations. So let's get back to the presentation. So you should have been able to come up with four different ways to do this. Now, in this case, an L LED, right, a light admitting diode, which you'll learn about in this class, is directional. So you wouldn't have been able to come up with four ways to do it. But a light bulb is not directional. It doesn't care which way you put it, so you can come up with this many 
options. All right, so let's move on to current. So current is the time rate change of charge. In other words, you've got charge coming through, right? And it's moving through over time. And current is basically how much charges come by over a certain amount of time. So dq dt, or the derivative um, of charge, is simply the change in charge over the change in time. Um, the book is going to use I if it's a constant current and a lowercase i if it's a time varying current. Um, and that can make it a little bit easier to just kind of glance at and see what's going on. Current is going to be measured in amperes. Um, and one ampere is equal to one coulomb per second. Um, direct current or DC current, um, you're going to use that capital I. And it means that the current is going to remain constant over time. In other words, for the time I am kind of recording, if you will, it is going to be not changing at all. Nice constant value. Um, there's also alternating current or AC current. And AC current is going to be used the lower case I, and it's going to vary over time. Okay, We in, have coming out of our wall alternating current Things like our cell phones and whatnot charge via direct current. And that's why we have to have things like this. This little box is going to convert it from AC in the wall to DC on the charger. So how is current direction defined? In other words, current, right, like a water in a stream, has to move from one location to some other location. Um, so it's kind of the opposite of what you think. A positive one amp is going to be the direction in which positive charges move. And a, in other words, it is the opposite direction for a negative charge. So in other words, the positive charges are going this way. So one amp is positive in that direction. In this case, negative are going this way. So it's positive in that direction. Now, this is a little weird and it's a little weird because we incorrectly assumed in this early historic stage of defining these things that it was the positive charges moving, when in reality it's electrons moving, and electrons have a negative charge. Um, and rather than redo every piece of thing we had ever created about circuits, we just said, okay, we're fine with that, it's gonna be opposite, okay? so. If you're asked which way the electrons are going to move, it's always going to be in the opposite direction of the current. All right, so we hit our first example. A conductor has a constant current of 5 amps. How many electrons pass a fixed point in the conductor in one minute? Okay, so in this problem, we have... All right, we have some kind of chamber, right? And in reality, this would be a wire, but we're gonna think about this. And we've got little charges and those charges are going past a certain point. And we're asking how, if it has a constant current of five amps, so we say we have five amps. And if I said those electrons, right, which are negative charges are going that way, then our positive current is going that way. But it doesn't matter. For every electron that moves here, we're going to have an equivalent amount of current moving that way. So it doesn't really matter that these are moving in different directions for this particular problem. Now, we defined an equation earlier that said I equals dq dt. Now, in this problem, it says a constant current, right? So in other words, this I should be a capital I. And we can think of these as it's not changing over time, it's just a time. So on the bottom, we have 60 seconds, right? Because I said that the unit of amps was gonna be coulombs per second. So we have 60 seconds, and we have a constant current of five amps, right? Whoops, sorry, five amps here. And we want to know how much charge there is. So we've got 5 amps times 60 seconds is equal to the amount of charge. 
So if you do that, you get 300 coulombs of charge. Now this problem doesn't ask us how much charge we have. It asks us how many electrons. And I said that the charge of an electron, right? Charge of an electron is equal to negative 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs, okay? So we have 300 coulombs here. And remember, it's going in the opposite direction. So we said that the five amps was going in the opposite direction of those charges. So in effect, there's kind of a negative sign here, but I wouldn't really worry about it because it doesn't matter in this problem. So we're trying to take, and we're trying to figure out how many of these things fit inside that thing. So in other words, we're doing a unit conversion. We're starting with one and we're going to the other one. So we have 300 coulombs and we want to figure out how many times 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs fits in there. And you should get 1.87 times 10 to the 21st electrons, which is what this problem is asking for. And that's a lot of electrons. In other words, five amps of current, which isn't a ton of current. Uh, let's see. This particular thing that charges my cell phone is three amps. So five amps is only a little bit more than we would charge our thing. And for a one minute of time, you get 1.87 times 10 to the 21st electrons. So it's a lot of electrons. All right, let's do another example. This one's a little bit more complicated. This one also uses the same starting equation, I equals dq dt. This one is actually asking for the total charge. In other words, it wants this top number and it has a time interval of zero to 10 seconds. So this problem is actually asking you to use calculus. So we're gonna take, and it says that dq dt equals i. So that's gonna ask us for an integral. So the integral of i dt equals the integral of dq. This is just going to become a q. Um, and this here is going to be dependent on what i is. So we're going to have q equals the integral from 0 to 10 seconds of 1 half t dt. And you do the math on this, and you get t squared over 4 between 0 and 10 seconds, which is just 10 squared over 4 minus 10 to the 0 over 4, and that will get you the solution you want, okay? Uh, and you have 25 coulombs. All right, so that's the answer to that particular problem. So not too bad once you recognize that you need to use calculus to solve the problem. Moving on, we're gonna do one more problem. And this is actually asking for the same equation. So we're using this equation kind of in three different ways. So again, derivative dq dt, this is a plot of q. And it's asking us to plot the charge flowing. Remember that charge flowing is just current, okay? And that means that it wants to know what the current is in this. So we're gonna come down here and we're gonna draw our axes. And there are these points, these two, this four, this six, this eight seconds that are important, right? So we're gonna go two, four, six, and eight. And then we're gonna need some labels on this later. But let's start there. This is going to be the current in terms of amps, okay? So let's change our color and start from here, okay? So dq dt. So what this means is it means find the slope, right, of this. So we're just gonna use basic algebra and the slope of this line is gonna be the rise over the run. So it's rising 50, it's running two. So rise of 50, run of two, and that gets us 25 as our slope. So right here, 
is going to be 25 amps. And between this point and this point, it's at 25 amps. Okay. Then we're going to go between the two and the six. And in this case, we are going to find our slope and we are rising from negative 50 or rather from 50 to negative 50, so which is a negative 100 rise. And we're running for four. So that's going to be a negative 25 amps between two and four. And here we're going rising 50, running two, and that'll get us again a positive 25. So this is just going to look like this nice horizontal lines between those points. And ta da, that is the answer. Okay, so we've gotten familiar with charge and current. So you've got electrons, they have a particular charge, they're moving through a channel. And that movement of those charges is called current. And now we're moving on to voltage. So voltage, which also can be called potential difference, is the amount of attraction or repulsion of two charges. So if you're starting with a charge, right, and you remember I said that way back in the day, they found out the positive is and negative is attracted. So if they have one thing that is negative, right, and you have something else that is positive, right, these two things are going to be attracted to each other. Okay. The amount of attraction or repulsion, in other words, how much this force effectively is here, is going to tell us what the voltage is. So if it's really, 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 really a lot of pull towards each other versus a lot of repulsion from each other, that tells us what the voltage is. Another way of stating that is it's the difference in electrical potential energy between two points per unit of electrical charge. So in other words, that means that our formula is V equals dWdq, where W is the electrical potential difference and Q is the amount of charge. You can also think of it as the work to move a charge. So in other words, if I want to take this negative charge and move it that way, how much effort does it take for me to move it between those two points? And that is another way of thinking about voltage. So voltage has a unit of volts. Um, and one volt is one joule per coulomb. Joule is an energy unit. Or you can rewrite that as one newton meter per coulomb. A newton is a force unit. So in other words, how much force does it take to move a meter depending on the amount of charge present? So voltage has polarity. And what polarity means is it has sign direction. So a magnet, right, if you have a positive and negative side of a magnet, they'll attract each other or they'll push each other depending on which they go. And voltage is the exact same way. It has a negative and positive. So anytime you write it, you have to define where the positive is and where the negative is. And that is the polarity, okay? So you would have two things. In other words, you have a nine volt thing here with a negative down here and a positive down here. And in this case, we have a negative nine volts with a negative here and a positive here. And they're the exact same thing because we've switched the sign here and we've switched the orientation here. So the voltage from A to B is the negative of the voltage from B to A. So in other words, if I'm going from A to B and I get a positive number, if I go from B to A, I'm going to get a negative number, but with the exact same value. Next, we're going to talk about power. So power is the time rate of supplying or absorbing energy. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what it means to supply or absorb energy later. But right now, you can just think of it as how much energy or excitement or whatever you want to think about it, there is over a certain amount of time. We use the units watts for this, right? And a watt is defined as a volt times an amp. In other words, this equation is pretty simple. It's just the power is equal to the voltage times the current. Okay. Now we said that voltage had a polarity, right? And we said that 
current, right, has a direction. In other words, it's going left to right or it's going right to left, right? And that means both of these things have signs and it means that the relative direction of those signs are gonna make a difference on if it's a positive or negative value. So in this case, this current here is going from the positive to the negative, and that's gonna be defined as a positive power. If instead that current is going from the negative to the positive, it's gonna be defined as a negative power. So let's talk a little bit more about that absorbance applied. So if a power has a positive sign, it's being absorbed. And if it has a negative sign, it's being supplied. In other words, if my power has a negative sign, when we use the convention here, it means that I am supplying power to the situation. In other words, I am giving it power. So for example, right, this power supply here has on it that it has a particular current and a particular voltage. And if I got a negative number from that calculation, that would mean this was supplying to my thing. On the other hand, my cell phone, which is plugging in it, is using the same amount of power. It has the same amount because this is supplying it to this, right? But my phone is absorbing it. It's gonna have a positive sign, right? So those two things kind of work together. So how do we figure out what that sign is? Well, we're gonna take the tactic that I described earlier and use some, a convention called the passive sign convention. And the passive combined convention means that the current enters through the positive terminal, that it is a positive power. So here's our current. It's entering here. And this guy is entering here, right? Notice those sign differences, right? This guy, right, is going this way and it's got a positive and this way and it's got a negative. So what exactly does that mean, right? Well, let's see. So here we're supplying. So I said, if it enters through the positive terminal is power, is positive. So it, that is supplied, it is negative. So what did I mean, right? This looks like it's entering through the positive. I'm right by the positive, but I'm not. What's important is how it enters this component here. So in this case, this three amps would have entered right here, right? Cause it has to go through there first. And therefore it's entering on this negative side and therefore the sign is negative and therefore it is being supplied, okay? Let's try this one. This current would have been drawn right here, right? So it's entering on the positive side, and that should mean that it is absorbed because we've got a positive sign, all right? You can do the same thing in a different way. So I tend to think of it, if the power points towards the positive pole, then it is supplying, and if it points towards the negative pole, it's absorbing, okay? so the there's our arrow right it points towards the negative right and therefore it's absorbing and this guy points towards the positive and therefore it is supplying so in general we've heard of conservation of energy well because energy and power are directly related it means that there must also be conservation of Power. And what this means in kind of the basic sense is the sum of all the elements in your circuit, right? So an example of a particular element might be this thing right here, is all of those must sum to zero. And this is a really, really good way to be able to check your math, right? If you got an answer and you're like, hey, am I right? You can do that calculation and verify that it still sums to zero. All right. So let's do another example. So this problem says, find the power. Remember, power is voltage times current of an element at five milliseconds if the current entering the positive terminal is five times cosine 60 pi t. So we said that the voltage is equal to two i. So two times five cosine 
60 pi t, right? And so that means that this is just going to be 10 cosine 60 pi t, right? We could, for example, plug our 5 milliseconds in there. So we would have 10 cosine of 60 pi times 5 times 10 to the negative third seconds. Um, so that's our voltage. And this asks us to find the power. So that means we're going to take the voltage and multiply it by the current. So the power is going to be the voltage. Times the current. Whoops, I probably could have put five times 10 to the negative third right there, right? Notice that this part and this part are identical, and then we have a 5 times 10. So you would get 50 cosine 60 pi, 5 times 10 to the negative third squared, okay? And I'm not going to worry about doing the math. This one's another integral. We'll go ahead and skip that one for now. All right, the next thing we're learning about is energy. Energy is the capacity to do work. So in other words, it's how much work can we do? And the unit of energy is joules, okay? Um, and that's an energy that you would see in physics a lot um, for energy. Like if you were asked what the potential energy of a rock on top of a hill, you would probably use joules. In the world of electricity and things like that, we also use watt hours, right? So notice that's just watt times the number of hours. Power companies use this because why would you ever use seconds? Um, because there's a lot of seconds in a day and a year and a month, and it would be really, really high numbers and that's hard to work with. So 3,600 joules is equal to one watt hour. And then those numbers are gonna be a lot smaller. So the formula to define energy is the energy is equal to the change or the integral of um, the power um, over time. All right, so we talked a little bit about things, but we haven't introduced many circuit elements. We talked about a battery a little. I talked about a uh, light bulb, right? These are all things you've seen, but there's two different categories of circuit elements. There's passive and there is non-passive, okay? So passive circuit elements include resistors. This is the symbol for a resistor, um, inductors, right? And capacitors. Those are three examples of passive circuit elements. Um, you will use lots of these and lots of these and only a little bit of these. Um, resistors are going to resist current change. So basically it is like if you had a stream with a whole bunch of logs in it because a beaver had knocked him down, it's hard for the water to get through. Same thing with a resistor. It makes it hard for the current to flow. Um, you've got an inductor. An inductor is just a coil of wire. Um, and that means that those charges are going around and around and around in a circle. And that will do certain things. One particular thing it'll do is it will cause a magnetic field. So a electromagnet is basically made out of really big inductors. Um, and then you have a capacitor. And a capacitor is stores energy. Notice that this symbol has a difference on the top from the bottom. That's because this element is by definition has polarity. In other words, it means that there's a positive and a negative sign of this symbol. Because it stores energy, it's like a battery that lasts for a very short amount of time, seconds or less, okay? Then you have active circuit elements, and active circuit elements are things that can generate energy. So obviously a generator makes sense. Batteries generate energy. Operational amplifiers generate energy. So it's anything that's going to supply energy. And we usually write those as current or voltage sources. So there should be a little line here, right? We talked about those passive ones. And then over here, we've got ones that aren't. So notice that this is a voltage 
supply, and this is a current supply, but why do I have two different symbols? Whether it's a voltage or a current, supplying voltage or current, doesn't really matter. Well, the reason I have two different symbols is these two with the circle are what are called independent sources, right? And an independent source sounds exactly what it means. It means that independent of anything else. So this would be an independent power source. I plug it in, I get a power. If on the other hand, I say, I'm gonna measure something over here and supply based on that choice. So if I measure five, I'm gonna output three. If I measure six, I'm an output two. That is a dependent source. And we use that kind of diamond shamble for a dependent source. Okay. So these are just a few elements. There are many, 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 many more. Um, we've got drawers and drawers of different things. And if you're learning circuits, you're going to have to know a lot about all of these, but understanding these fundamental simple things is where it all starts. And that's what we're going to learn about kind of today, right? We're going to learn about those simple things. So we talked about voltage, we talked about power, we talked about energy, um, and we learned some basic elements and kind of their effect on other things. I hope that was interesting and helpful. And um, if you have any questions, let me know.